For those of you guys watching online right now from coast to coast and across the Fruited Plains, uh, my name is Joe. I'm the pastor here at Lynchburg City Church, and if God puts it on your heart to give to the church, you can do so by going to lynchburgcitychurch.com. Uh, just pray with me, guys. Um, Lord, we love you because you first loved us. We love you because you first loved us, and I thank you for that love, Lord. Um, and uh, I thank you that we can be here with one another today. Um, Lord, for uh, my daughter Geneva, uh, her first Sunday here with us, I I'm very excited. And Lord, specifically for her, I, I pray, Lord, that you would help me and her mother to disciple her well. I pray that she would grow up to, to love you and serve you. Um, that she would marry a boy that also loves and serves you, that she would have children that loves and serves you, and that those children would have children that love and serve you, and that those children would have children that love and serve you, and that those children would have children that love and serve you. Please watch over her, Lord, and, um, and uh, just show her grace and uh, sustain her health. Uh, and, and Lord, um, for our leaders, um, for President Biden, uh, we pray a special grace and mercy uh, in his life right now, Lord. Um, I, I pray, Lord, that you would protect and preserve his health, um, his mental health. Um, Lord, for all of our leaders, especially the ones we, we don't like at all, Lord, they need an extra added degree of, of grace. I pray for President Biden that you would save him. Lord, for our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, our marines, coast guardsmen in the space force, Lord, those at home and abroad, we pray for their safety, we pray for their protection, we pray for their salvation. So many of those guys, Lord, they don't know you, they don't love you. Save them, Jesus. Lord, we think of the persecuted church right now, for Leah Sherabu still being held by Boko Haram in, in Nigeria because she's a, a Christian, or Pastor Yusuf imprisoned in Iran, or Pastor Wang, or Pastor John imprisoned in China because they're Christians. For the Christians, Lord, in North Korea, for the Christians in Afghanistan, in Somalia, in the South Sudan, in Eritrea, in Nigeria, in some of the, the most difficult places to be a Christian. Lord, we remember those, as the author of Hebrews reminds us, we remember those who are in chains as if in chains with them. Please, God, help them. Please strengthen them and their faith. And today, Lord, for us, I pray that we'd hear from you. I pray that you give us concentration abilities. I pray, Lord, that you'd free us from whatever distractions or competing thoughts that are vying for our attention, that you'd help me to correctly handle your word, that you'd keep me from error and, and and lord if there's something i shouldn't say today that i fully intend to say don't don't let me say it and if there's something i need to say that i haven't even planned for i i, I pray that you give me your word i pray for a fresh filling of the spirit in my life and i pray lord that all of us would walk out of here with a deeper love of who you are we pray this in your great name jesus amen <coughs> all right so we are uh, in john's gospel this is part 24 Part 24, I know some of you guys, I, I, I've only been here, I think, once in the last three weeks, twice in the last four weeks, because I've been going to D.C. Uh, with the Army, because I'm an Army chaplain, so I'm definitely glad to be back, glad to be back in John's Gospel. But if you are visiting for the first time, you should know right up front, uh, we love expository preaching, because uh, it's, I don't know, awesome. Uh, that's where you go. If you don't know what that is, that's where you're going to go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through a story. And we do that for a lot of different reasons. The, the two that come to my mind right now is that really helps prevent taking verses out of context. And, and number two, it helps maintain the author's intended meaning. So we're in chapter eight, uh, verse 12. I'll give you some background information in just a second. This is part 24, my 24th sermon I preached. So let's just get in, right into the text. It says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He's the light of the world. And whoever follows him, they're not going to walk in darkness, but they're going to have the light of life. And the backdrop of this story is taking place within the Feast of Tabernacles. And it seems that just about every time I've preached in John's Gospel since the beginning of chapter 7 for like four or five sermons, the backdrop is the Feast of Tabernacles, otherwise known as the Feast of Booths, right? Because it's to commemorate their time during the wilderness wanderings when they 
just lived in little booths and, and tents and, and temporary like dwelling places. And so if it helps, like paint the picture clear. This is like the state fair. Everyone's traveling for the long weekend. If they can make the trip, they're going to Jerusalem. The whole city kind of balloons in population. It's hustle and bustle. And during the Feast of Tabernacle, during the Feast of Booths, there would be this lighting ceremony of Four huge lamps in the temple of the court of women. And the Mishnah tell us men of piety and good works would dance through the night holding burning torches in their hands, singing songs of praise. The Levitical orchestra would just cut loose. Uh, Some sources attest that this went on every single night during the Feast of Tabernacles with the light from the temple area just glowing all over Jerusalem. Thus it is no coincidence that Jesus is saying this here and now to the people that I'm the light of the world. He's the light of the world. Not just in Jerusalem, the light of the world, right? He doesn't say, hey, I'm the light of the Jews. Nope, doesn't say that. He doesn't say, hey, I'm the light of the Palestinians. Nope, nope. He doesn't say, I'm the light of every gun-toting, tobacco-chewing, country music festival-loving Republican Party member. Doesn't say that. He says, I'm the light of the world. Not just a group, not just some people, the world. In other words, the gospel of Jesus extends to every ethno-linguistic, socio-economic person. And I don't know about you, but that's really great news. It's really, 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 really great news. And I want to clarify for a second. This does not mean that everyone in the world is going to experience this light. Just because Jesus is the light of the world doesn't mean everyone receives it. But rather what it means is the world has no other light than Jesus. If there's going to be a light in this world, it's Jesus That's your choice. It's it's Jesus or no light. It's Jesus or darkness. There's no third alternative. There is no other light. There is no other option. You just got two choices. It's Jesus or death. That's why Jesus calls and refers to hell as the outer darkness in Matthew 8, 12, 22, 13, 25, 30. And so he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so what he's saying is this, if you follow me, you'll have me as your light. And you won't be cast into the outer darkness. And if he is your light, he's also going to reveal your sin. And, And this is vitally important that our sin is revealed to us. Otherwise, it's going to kill us. The light shows us our sin. The light shows us our sin while there's still time to repent. In the same way that maybe an early diagnosis can show us the war path of a deadly cancer in our bodies. This is what he does as the light of the world. He says, whoever follows me, they won't walk in darkness. (coughs) So the implication here is, there are people who walk in darkness. And, And that, of course, shouldn't shock us. We live in a world that is very dark. The prophet Isaiah tells us in chapter 5, verse 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Jesus says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. We live in a very dark world. A world that has parades for things that we should mourn and have funerals for. Like We live in a world in which telling the truth is no more than just personal preference. We live in a world in which we celebrate the Hamas martyrs who raped women who murdered children, who kidnapped and dragged out people out of their homes to be executed in the streets, we celebrate that, or at the very least we ignore that, and I wish that was hyperbole, but it's not. It comes straight out of these Marxist communist universities that tell people what Hamas did was righteous and that Israel needs to be eradicated like the disease that they are from the river to the sea. 
And then on top of that, we have members of our United States House of Representatives who support and celebrate this mantra. So Jesus is very clear about this. If you follow me, you won't walk in darkness, but only if you follow me. In other words, Christianity isn't just believing in Jesus. See, according to verse 12, it's following Jesus. And following Jesus is more than just tagging along behind him or or watching the occasional sermon or, or going to the occasional church service. It's joining him. It's aligning yourself with him. But notice the last phrase of verse 12. You will have the light of life. For those who follow him and don't walk in darkness, they will have the light of life. You say, what does that mean? Because that sounds really familiar. It it almost sounds a lot like, what is that? John chapter 1 verse 4? Remember that? That's okay. I think we have it on the screen. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. In him was life. In Jesus was life. And the life was the light of men. That is to say, the life gives the light. The life Jesus has, he shares with those who follow him. And by doing that, gives them light. Or to say it another way, the way the Apostle Paul would say it in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And prior to this happening, we, and by we I mean everyone, are dead and blind in our sins. Then Jesus, he shows up, and then Jesus imparts to us this light by sharing his life. And then we see, and then we aren't in darkness any longer. It is by no accident that Jesus says this with the backdrop of the festival of tabernacles and the lighting ceremony going on during this festival. But now come the opposition and the haters. Verse 13. So the Pharisee said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. They're saying, Jesus, you can't do that. You can't say that, Jesus. And and when the Pharisees uh, challenge him, they bring Jesus' own words up from John chapter 5, 31, where Jesus had said, if I bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. And now they're like, oh, see, see, you're contradicting yourself, Jesus. You just said your testimony is false because you're bearing witness about yourself. You just said I'm the light of the world, but you don't have any witnesses to back that up. Uh, Of course, the irony here is that while they essentially quote him and refer to what he said in chapter 5 about the need for witnesses, which they agree to that point, they don't actually accept the testimony of the witnesses that he produced. John the Baptist, the works he did, his father, the scriptures, that's all in chapter 5, 33, 37. So, so Jesus doesn't bother calling on more witnesses because that's really not what this is about. They don't really care about witnesses. All they care about is finding him guilty. All they care about is being right, even if they're wrong. Some of you are like this. Some of you know people like this who only care about being right. Like this is the type that person who they won't listen to correction they won't listen to reason they only listen to themselves their truth is the only truth that matters but the reality is it's not truth that they're after it's their pride in holding to their own opinions in favor of the facts so here's what jesus says jesus answered even if i do bear witness about myself even if i do My testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I came from or where I am going. The the two big questions center upon his origin and his destination. That is to say, where he came from and where he's going. And at this point, he essentially says, how can you guys possibly know what's true? Because you can't even answer those basic questions about me. And so... He says, verse 15, you judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. And the big question is this, 
what does Jesus mean when he says he judges no one? Because I'm pretty sure back in John chapter 7, 24, he actually advocating judging. John 7, 24, he says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So did he just contradict himself? And my short answer is no, not, not at all. In other words, what he means in saying this is he doesn't judge anyone the way his opponents do. He doesn't appeal to superficial, fleshly criteria and accordingly judge people unfairly like they do all the time, including right now in front of them. And so he says, if that's what you guys want to define and mean by judging, then, then I can honestly say that I don't participate in that type of judging. Verse 16, Yet even if I do judge, he says, which of course the implication is he does, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. <coughs> in, in other words, he clarifies verse 15 even further here in verse 16 by acknowledging that while he does, of course, judge, he doesn't do it the way these guys do. Nonetheless, he does judge. In fact, by his very presence, Jesus guarantees that humanity is going to be divided around him, correspondingly judged by him. Chapter 9, 39, the test to that. And then that's because Jesus, as the Son of Man, he's been given special authority to exercise judgment. You may remember that from chapter 5, 27. And as he notes here in verse 16, he does this only as he hears from the Father. And thus his judgment is true. And it's not just true, but it's also just. Not, not to be confused with the, the unjust judgment that he just exposed of the religious leaders. And so 17 and 18 says this, in your law, Jesus is still talking to his opponents. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. Uh, what Jesus is saying here is this. You guys started off this conversation really concerned about one thing. Back in verse 13, the issue was, Jesus, you don't have any witnesses. But remember, he... He did have witnesses. He introduced them back in chapter 5, but that didn't matter. And that's because they already made up their minds. Because they had already rendered a verdict. Because they had already decided before the evidence was actually brought. And some of you, you, you know people like this. It doesn't matter the evidence. It doesn't matter the proof that you have. It's just, boom, automatically guilty. So I mean, no, these type of people, like they won't listen to anything you have to say. Like all rational thought has escaped them. Nothing's going to persuade them. For these people, the need to have witnesses, that only matters if you don't have any witnesses. And if you do have witnesses and you're able to produce witnesses, like Jesus was back in chapter 5, well, then it doesn't matter. <laughs> and you thought the media was biased and only cared about their narrative. Like, like these guys take it to a whole new level. And so Jesus tells them, I'm not speaking on my own. The Father is my witness, and we're always in agreement with one another. Verse 19. And they said to him, <coughs> well, um, where's your father? Can you produce him? Like, where is he at? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. They misinterpret what he just said, because they're, they're only thinking on a purely human level. They don't get it, because they walk in darkness. That's why they don't get it. And then comes verse 20. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. His hour hadn't come yet. John's point here is to highlight God's sovereignty in his perfect timing. They don't arrest Jesus. Yep, wasn't the right time. Hour hadn't come yet. It wasn't God's will for Jesus to be taken and killed yet because it wasn't the right time yet. And I think a lot of us struggle with this. A lot of us struggle with God's timing. Maybe no one in here, but I'm going to go on a limb and say some of you do. Like Sometimes I'll hear a girl. I remember one comical story. A girl comes up to me. Joe, I think I met my future husband. Really? Yeah, who is he? Well, he doesn't actually know who I am yet, but I've already started writing him letters. I've got pictures of him up on my vision board. Don't worry, it's not weird. The pictures are only there so I remember to pray for him. Okay. Uh, listen, maybe it is God's will for you to marry him, but you know what? It's definitely, it's definitely not the right timing. 
yet. Or, or one of my favorites is like when um, I get this conversation from a guy. Joe, I've met this girl. I like her. She likes me. Yes, she knows, she knows who I am. Okay, that's good. Yeah, and I think, I think it's God's will for, for us to get married. Can you give me any advice? Well, do, do you have a job? Uh, no, no, I don't. Uh, okay. How about, how about housing? Do you have any housing? No, I, I just live at home right now. Okay, well, do you pay your own bills? Well, no, my, my parents do. Okay, well, do you have insurance? Insurance. I don't, maybe, I don't, I'll get to get back to you on that, right? Well, are you in school? Well, yeah, but, but just part-time, because like anything over six credits just kind of stresses me out. Like, <sighs> And that's where I usually get really honest. And I'm like, dude, it, it might be God's will for you to like marry this girl, but I'll tell you what, it's definitely not his timing right now. Like, if you can't take care of yourself, like, you probably shouldn't have, like, a goldfish, let alone a girlfriend, man. <laughs> like, that's the point John's trying to make. God's sovereign timing is perfect, and no one's going to interfere with his son's life prematurely. And I think knowing that, knowing the, the reality, like, the, 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 the brilliance of verse 20 should bring us a lot of comfort as it relates to our own lives, our own struggles, our own challenges. Not to mention, I think knowing the truth of verse 20 should increase our trust and confidence in God whose timing is always perfect. It's always perfect. It's always the right time for God. I love verse 20. Well, here's what he says in 21. So he said to them again, I'm going away and and you'll seek me and you will die in your sin. Wow. Where I am going, you cannot come. Understand that Jesus is going to say a very similar thing to his own disciples. But their outcome is totally different than these people who he says are going to die in their sins. And the key difference is for those who don't follow him, where have I heard that? Let's go back to verse 12. For those who don't follow him, only hell and the outer darkness awaits them. See, these people addressing Jesus, they're going to continue looking for the Messiah, which is why Jesus says you're going to continue looking for me, but they're not going to find him. They're not going to find him because he's standing in front of them right now, and they don't even recognize him right now. They, they can't see him. And then it says in verse 22, so the Jews said, well, is he going to kill himself? Like, is he going to commit suicide since he says, where I am going, you cannot come? Uh, verse 22 just continues to capture more misunderstanding. That They're only thinking in purely like a, a human level. And then verse 23, he said to them, you are from below, I am from above, you are of this world, I am not of this world. I think verse 23 helps answer the question to why his opponents can't recognize who he is. It also answers the question for why unbelievers today can't recognize who he is. In other words, unless one is following Jesus, the light of the world, they won't be able to see. Because you can't see without having light. But, but therein lies the problem. Therein lies the inability of man. And that's because if I can't see in my current state, if in my current state I'm blind and I can't find my way out, and the only way for me to get out of the darkness is to follow Jesus, but I can't see to follow Jesus? Like, how is it even possible? And it's usually where people get mad at me because, and I I just have to admit this to you, I have a a really bad tendency. It's something I'm, I'm really guilty of to just quote the Bible and quote what Jesus says. And people will get upset at me. I'm being serious about this part. They'll get upset with me because they really want me to say something very man-centric to resolve the tension or the hurdles or the challenges to our our spiritual state of of being blind and and, in darkness, right? They usually want me to say something along the lines of, well, anyone can fix their spiritual condition. You just got to do it. You just got to make it happen. It's it's up to you in in this very American, individualistic, gospel sort of way. You just got to work hard, pull yourself up from the bootstrap sort of way. And the problem is, other than this sort of gospel makes you look great 
and doesn't put the glory on God, it puts it on you. I just can't say that. I can't say that because the spiritual problem that we have as unbelievers is too big for you. I can't say that because I just don't see that Jesus teaches that like anywhere, but rather the opposite seems to be true. Like, I don't know, here in verse 23, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. That's the reason for the inability, Jesus says, to grasp the truth that he is preaching. That's, that's it. The inability, I think, is the right word. And so he says in verse 24, I told you, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And what's interesting about verse 24 is he uses the plural of the word sins. I don't know if you know that. See, verse 21, he used the singular. Verse 24, he used the plural. And I think that the reason he uses the plural in 24 is to make it crystal clear. We're not just talking about that one little sin, that tiny little small issue that we really try to justify or excuse, but rather for the non-Christian, it's all sin. It's a diverse, ugly plethora of rebellion and unbelief. He says, you're all going to die in your sins. So insensitive of him, isn't it? So narrow-minded. So offensive for Jesus to say. But here's the thing, like, I'm okay with offending you. Because it seems to be Jesus is okay with offending these people. Furthermore, as MacArthur says, let people be offended. They've lived their entire lives in offense to God. And, and so this re reality awaits everyone who dies apart from Jesus. Who dies in, in the darkness that they're at. And you say, what's the, what's the solution? Well, he says in the latter part of verse 24, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And, and if you read that line too quickly, you might just miss what he said. Especially the I am part. Because it was by no accident that Jesus says it this way. And that's because what he says to them is a direct claim to full deity. It's something that they would have understood. Because if you go back to Exodus 3.14, when Moses asked God his name and he replied, I am who I am, that is the same phrase Jesus is using here in the Greek. What Jesus is doing is he is offending them by telling them the truth. And not just that, but he's offering them hope just as he's offering some of us hope today. And so the, the solution is to believe. You say, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to believe? Believe that Jesus is who he says he is. He says, I am. He says, he's God. And if he is who he says he is, you must follow him. And following him the right way involves a commitment to obedience. Not when it's convenient, not when it's comfortable, not when you feel like it. And that's because we do not get to pick and choose these things any more than we get to pick and choose the parts of Scripture that we like and ignore the other parts. This is what it really means to follow him, to be all in with him. And so it says in verse 25, so Jesus said to them, excuse me, so they said to him, who are you? Who, who are you, dude? Paraphrase. Jesus said to them, just what have I been telling you from the beginning? I have much to say about you and much to judge. But he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. Uh, they, they asked, who, who are you? He's, he's already told them who he is. They just don't really want to listen. They don't really want to listen. Just like most non-Christians today. Until God does a miracle in their lives. And so, it says this, verse 28. So Jesus said to them, When you had lifted up, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. And that nothing I do on my own authority. I do nothing on my own authority, but I speak just as the Father taught me. And He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Key phrase? Then you will know. Wait, when, when does that occur? When the Son of Man's been lifted up. When the Son of Man's... When the, when, hmm. in, in other words, the full disclosure of who Jesus is will take 
place at the cross because according to Jesus, that's one of the functions of the cross to reveal who he is. And to be clear, John isn't saying that all of Jesus' opponents are going to be converted and become Christians when this happens, but rather if they do come to know Jesus, they will most assuredly know it because of the cross. And then he says in verse 30, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. Many believed in him. What's the only hope for people today, guys? It's Jesus. It's the only hope for the Jewish people today. It's the only hope for the Palestinian people today. This is the only hope for Democrats today. This is the only hope for Republicans today. This is the only hope for you. This is the only hope for me. And that is to believe. And the implication, if we truly believe, is as verse 12 would say, we follow him, we join him, we obey him. In other words, there is light and hope for those who follow the light of the world. But for those who don't, a line is drawn. And for those who don't follow the light of the world, they remain, they remain on the other side of that line, on the other side of that divide, in the outer darkness, and they will die in their sins. So I take issue when people like Andy Stanley, who I'm not really that big of a fan of, tells his congregation very recently, Jesus doesn't draw lines. Jesus doesn't make demands of people. He draws big circles. And that includes all kinds of like sinners like me and you. But that's really not true. Case in point right here. He says you're going to die in your sins. That's a line. That's not a circle. He doesn't say it's okay, don't worry about it. You can follow Jesus, you cannot follow Jesus. You follow me, you've not fo- like all roads lead to the same place. Doesn't matter. I forgive you no matter what. <clears throat> One of the greatest tragedies in the modern church today is this watering down of the gospel because we're just so concerned with offending people despite the fact people have been offending God their entire lives. And as a result, all these gospel presentations are essentially just neutered. And it usually goes along the lines of something like this. God, he's got such a wonderful plan for your life. It's filled with like lollipops and cotton candy and butterflies and no hell and no wrath and no justice, just forgiveness. Everybody gets forgiven. That's not the gospel. That's a castration of the gospel. And then as a result, you've got all these pretend Christians who are just encouraged to keep playing the religion game despite Jesus very clearly saying, not once, but twice in this story, you will die in your sins. You'll go to hell forever. You'll face the wrath of God. And the religious leaders in this story, they just assume, oh, I'm always right. They're never wrong. For them, it's always the other person that the problem is with. It's never them. Not now, not ever. And I'll say this right now. If you want to know how to be a good religious hypocrite, just do what these guys are doing. Just keep ignoring all the things that Jesus says. Just keep believing that you're always right and the problem always rests with someone else because that's the exact recipe to find yourself in permanent darkness, separated from from Jesus forever. He is the light of the world. He is the only hope that we have. The world, the only hope that they have is not based in elections, it's in Jesus. It's Jesus or nothing. So as the team comes, I want to pray for us. Jesus, I pray that our hope would be further renewed today. That it's you or nothing. It's you or darkness. It's you or hell. And that we would follow you, not tag along, but that we would follow hard after you. I thank you, God, that your timing is always perfect. I thank you, God. I thank you, God, for all that you've done in our lives to think that for those of us who believe, Lord, it's because a miracle took place. We were once lost, now we're found. We were once in darkness, and and, and now we've been given uh, the light of the gospel. We owe you everything, God. I pray, Lord, that you would make us courageous Christians. 
who are more concerned with offending people and telling them the truth than pacifying them, Lord, with a neutered gospel. Help us be willing to say true things to the people that we know, Lord, who are not following you, who are not walking in the light. Lord, for our unsaved friends and family members right now, I pray that you would save them, that you would grant them a heart of repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. We pray this in your great name, amen.